This is the first of the R-Chain Cooperative R-Chain uh, Row VM discussions. Our goal here is to start with the 20,000 foot approach to the R-Chain VM, Row VM, and to get increasingly more specific with every publication. So Greg Meredith, the man behind the scenes here, um, how are you doing? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, now that we got all the formal stuff out of the way, now that we've convinced them we're legitimate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, the uh, what's available to the public right now, anyway, is the last version of the architecture document. There have been some changes since then. Um, but I guess in, uh, let's start very, very general. In the fewest amount of sentences possible, uh, what is Rovium? So the Rovium is a virtual machine for executing row laying contracts. Um, it derives directly from the row calculus. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, that's probably that's the simplest answer that we can dive yeah. in on later. That's good. Um, so the row VM, uh, does it sit on top of the JVM? Uh, kind of, sort of, not really. Um, so I want to I make a distinction between implementation versus architecture. Sure. Right? So, so a VM can have a, um, a specification that uh, lives independently of any particular implementation. So the row VM is like that, right? So it has a spec that is independent of any implementation. Um, and um, in the, so we're in the midst of making a very quick implementation, um, which we will then, which gives us end-to-end -end functionality, which we will then um, uh, reiterate uh, to have a, a more complete solution. So let me describe that a little bit. Um, there's there's a there's a, a way in which we can um, we can um, make the row VM itself evaporate in a series of transformations from uh, an an um, um, an IR or a, an intermediate representation. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the the row VM itself, um, uh, there will be code that represents uh, computations in that VM that you can then transform into, uh, into code that uh, represents computations in another VM. And that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, so, uh, and, and initially we had thought about one compilation path, uh, which I'll describe, and then we changed our mind after doing the due diligence on that, uh, on that compilation path to a different compilation path. So the compilation pathway you're, um, you're speaking of, the first one anyway, was um, it went from um, Rolang to RoVM to an intermediate representation to the Lambda, and then used the OCaml uh, compilation strategy to go to LLVM. But That's correct, yes. Yeah, but you've decided not to use LLVM um, and have substituted it for what? Uh, the Rosette VM. The Rosette VM. Yes, which is, uh, you can see a copy of that on the GitHub repo over at Rchain. Cool. Uh, yeah. Excellent, okay. Um, well then, and, and, I to and, I, and I totally think that these, these conversations should be as, you know, as um, information and as um, demonstration chock full as they possibly can. So wherever oh, yeah, you yeah. take, uh, you know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so, but just to round out the, the answer to your question, so you were asking about the relationship to the Java VM. So we have an implementation of the Rosette VM in C++. Okay. We're in the process of doing a clean room uh, implementation of the Rosette VM on, in the Java ecosystem. Gotcha. So that's where, just to be clear, you take the specification um, transformations and rewrite them not in C++, but I'm guessing in Scala, right? Yeah, in Scala, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, so, so, so to be super, super clear, um, RoVM, or sorry, yeah, RoVM intermediate representation will be turned into Rosette bytecode representation. Um, <laughs> and I can walk you through the, the compilation path there. And Excellent. then... And then the Rosette um, bytecode um, will be <coughs> um, compiled down, uh, will be um, evaluated inside a, a Java or Scala program, right? That implement, that does a re-implementation of the VM. Now, mm -hmm. there, there is an alternative code path, right? Which would, would be to take the bytecode uh, for the Rosette VM and translate that into the, the Java VM. Yeah, that's the most obvious. That's that seems like the most obvious way to do it. So why not? 
because we don't really know what the semantics of the Java JVM. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if we really understood the semantics of the JVM, and 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 there are there are some formal specs for the JVM, um, but they're for toy versions. Gotcha. Uh, uh, now that that said, K framework has come along and provided a fairly big coverage of the JVM with a formal spec. Mm -hmm. So so it's not that far off, right? We, we could we could, but I, I want to do this um, in term by being sensitive to time to market, right? So okay. first, we just want to we want to demonstrate that you know we can get the uh, Rolang contracts running on top of the Rosette VM, and for that, there's no need to have the JVM implementation. Uh, and in fact, what you can do is you can do a source-to-source -source translation of Rolang to Rosette, and mm -hmm. then and then compile the Rosette code uh, for the uh, Rosette VM. And Bob's your uncle, right? And that's only only to demonstrate that you know we have the uh, compilation path working, right? And and that can be happening independent. So the compiler people can be working on that bit, while the VM and storage people are working on you know a re-implementation of the VM and storing the byte codes and VM state on the, uh, the blockchain. Gotcha. So, and, and that's, so I have, I have two questions then um, in response to your answer. Um, first, and this is, I mean, we all know very well because we work with the information daily, but um, I was hoping that you could go into uh, the specific, um, the specific needs that uh, Rovium has and the design choices that it's made and why. Uh, specifically, Rolang contracts will support internal concurrency. That's low-level concurrency, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, so that's why we jettisoned the LLVM path, because mm -hmm. LLVM is effectively only sequential, and the concurrency happens more or less by stamping out new copies of the VM. Yeah, um, which and, means they've got to be very light. They've got to be very... No, well, the, yeah, but the LLVM is not that light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And so, so where, whereas the Rosette VM from the ground up was designed to have this this lightweight concurrency model, mm. um, which takes advantage of you know um, uh, uh, you know if you only have a single thread, then it runs so far so fast. If you have multiple threads, it runs faster, right? Mm. And how those threads map onto hard actual hardware threads is yet an interest another interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of people have, I think, and there have been tons of discussions and, and YouTube is definitely a better place to, to go into the specifics, but a lot of people understand fundamentally what concurrency is and they mistake it for asynchrony or parallelism. Um, just to be clear, concurrency isn't parallelism or asynchrony. Uh, rather, it is the ability to decompose uh, large processes into smaller, independently uh, operating non-blocking processes, but arguably uh, concurrency is the best vehicle for asynchrony and parallelism. Um, right, right. So, so asynchrony will get you um, will get you a flavor of concurrency. Yeah. Um, right. So, so it, it it boils down to message arrival order non determinism. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but if but it, but when we're talking about concurrent execution of instructions, is a little bit more to it. Right. And that that's what really what we're what we're hoping for here. Um, and the reason for that, if you think about it, is because um, you absolutely need um, uh, uh, in order to be scalable at the level of the total number of contracts we're talking about, where like in the case of the attention economy, every single post um, in a social media is its own contract. Right. So that so if you think about your Facebook feed, right? How many posts are there, right? And if each one of those is its own contract or its own instance of a contract, mm -hmm. right? What, what what's the kind of scale are we talk? What kind of scale we're talking about? Especially if we're talking about like five hundred million feeds. Yeah, yeah, right. Or, so, or, or I mean, you know, or equivalent to the uh, the amount of contracts for every Facebook user in the world, which is what four or five billion, something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are so many nowadays. So many people. <laughs> it's like the world is filling up with them. It's nuts. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Um, okay, so yeah. then uh, no, I no. Sorry, I think it's I think Facebook is is only at like five hundred million users, something like that. It was because there's there's only like a, you know six billion people on the planet, right? Yeah, yeah, but but I'd. Uh, 
Okay, we'll follow up on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should definitely look at the numbers. Yeah, but, but anyway, I mean, the, the, the point is scale, right? Massive scale. So if you're gonna if you're gonna support that many contracts, basically the name of the game is concurrency. You, to, in order to scale, you're gonna have to have really fine grain concurrency. Um, and so you, you know, if you're if you're if you're if your nodes are taking up, you know, uh, entire boxes as opposed to um, you know, um, a few hyper threads on a, on a, on a chip, right. Then that's too coarse grained. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's what we're, that's, that's where we're aiming. Gotcha. So that's, um, that's language level. Um, and then because common and dorks can get slightly, um, convoluted, uh, especially for people coming from the outside, um, what's the higher levels? So row VMs are also concurrent, meaning, Yes, that's correct, right? So, so in so each contract has its own uh, can have multiple threads running inside it, mm -hmm. um, and then you can have multiple contracts running inside a VM, mm -hmm. and then you can have multiple VMs running. Um, and essentially, the structure is really just an iterated composition mm -hmm. of concurrent execution. And the the VM gives you this ability to do that, mm -hmm. and the 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 magic sauce is the way in which. Um, the, the core reduction rule or the core um, um, transition rule in the VM works because it, it works using um, channels, a, an abstraction called a channel. Mm -hmm. uh, and so essentially what you can, uh, so, so what that means is that each, each VM instance is operating over a collection of channels and, and a collection of channels uh, we can call a namespace or a channel mm -hmm. space. The namespace is the best. We use name and channel um, synonymously. Mm -hmm. um, so, so then um, the way you compose these VMs is by um, uh, you can you can launch lots of them. In fact, multiple of them could be running on a single box. Yeah, there's right. there's no row VM. There are many there's a multiplex of row vms right right exactly so, there, yeah. lots, lots and lots of them are running yeah. and um and they're composed because they're operating on different namespaces mm -hmm. so so, uh, so the the idea is and when you say namespaces it's a simple way to say um it's just um a partition transactional environment is would that be an correct uh, appraisal it's yes yes right right but but that that actually falls out of the semantics you go if you go yeah. the other way and you just say that a namespace is just a collection of channels yeah yeah that's all it is right right and then and then the way the channels are used is to to coordinate transactions exactly yep. yeah um cool well excellent um and the, the what, what I was thinking uh, maybe we could go into and this could be the first um, appearance of whatever visual that you'd like to introduce is how storage consensus and the VM work together um, in ideally as sequentially a presentation as uh, could be made. Um, specifically, if I have, if a, if a Rolang program is executing, where does it start and where does it end? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, okay, that's good. I mean, I, I don't have visuals prepared specifically for this, no, but, I can, but, I, but I can, I can uh, but we do have visuals for exactly this question already. <laughs> Yes. So you don't need to look at my Facebook. <laughs> um, oh, it's uh, speaking of it's it's just over one billion. Just over one billion. Just over one billion. Okay. I I, I remember when they hit the five hundred million mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh wait, actually, I think I've got it here. Let me try. I think it's here. Okay. Yeah. So so here's a link which we can make available to the user. Yep. The mobile process calculate for programming the new blockchain. Mm -hmm. Um, on read the docs and um, let's see. I want to go to. Uh, I think it's enter the blockchain is where the section is. Okay, yeah. So let me see. Yes, this is the one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let me expand this. And oops. Whoa! Don't do that. Oh, I see. Okay. Center that and bring it here. Hopefully that. Okay, so what, what, how, how to read this diagram? So if you look down along the bottom here, what it really is is just a um, a Rolang contract. It's a row, it's an expression in Rolang that could easily be a contract. Um, and the way to read it, um, uh, if, if you ignore these little boxes for a minute, I might have this in OmniGraphle. Let's see if I've got it in OmniGraphle. Um, 
Uh, maybe. Oh, those are uh, data race conditions. Yeah, let me see. No, that's not it. Let me see. Um, I know. Okay, so it's not here. Um, okay, it looks like that's not it. And that's not it. Uh, the Omni graph. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, where is this thing? I know I had it. Okay, well, maybe I'll just redraw it a little bit. So I'll go back to this one and this one. Okay, so if we look, um, we can. I, I think the the original on on the mobile processes uh, representation is is just fine. Yeah, but here I can actually I can actually just do it in real time. Okay, cool. All right, so if we go here, um, and if we look right here, um, this is the basic form. Um, the form is uh, a four comprehension. So it says from this channel x one, we pick up this data y one, and from this channel x two, we pick up this data y two yada 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 out through yep. n yep. and if we meet a certain condition where this condition is typically parameterized in the y ones through y ins mm -hmm. um, then we're going to run p all right so if we go back to um this that's what these are here so for you know this value from this address out to this value from this address mm -hmm. run something and then the squirrely braces from here to here are our p yeah. And here, here we haven't expressed the condition, but that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a, we can think of that as a, as a condition. And, and the idea is that this constitutes a kind of observational boundary, right? So we, we don't get to enter into this, um, uh, into the curly brace unless we have made these observations. Yep. And, and, notice, um, and notice also that uh, the semicolon, um, the join itself uh, allows us um, the values to be received sequentially, uh, such as not to impose uh, race conditions? Uh, actually, um, the for comprehension here is monadic. Mm -hmm. So you can make a semicolon be a sequential join, or you can have it be a parallel join, Ooh. or you can have it be a policy and uh, about any versus all or some logical combination thereof. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that's actually really important. Um, here we're using um, Oleg's logic T semantics because mm -hmm. what we really want to think about, think about the address really as a stream of values, right? Mm -hmm. So you pull off one and then the address is updated and then you get another and the address is updated and you get another. Live so data, yep. All right, so you can think of each address as kind of providing a stream of values. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really looking for is you want to go so far, you, you want to find some position in this stream and some position in the next stream and some position in the next stream, such that the, the, the range of values met, uh, meets a certain condition. Mm -hmm. and, then, and only then will you move into the, the remainder of the, the, the contract, yeah. which we call the continuation. Yeah. So the continuation is running under a guarantee that certain observations have been made that match a condition. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the transactional guarantee, and you can you can relate that to the block, right? So so the basically what the block is saying that this transaction is causing this address to have this value, yada yada yada. This transaction is causing this address to have. So this why value. why use um why use that that terminology? I feel like you did that extremely intentionally, uh, causing to have some sort of value. Oh yeah yeah. I'm, what I, what I'm saying is that that. That there's a, the textual, the meaning, the transactional meaning of this program is is directly related to the uh, the, the standard interpretation of the blockchain itself. Yep, exactly. Yep. Right. So and so and and this is the this is the tightest correspondence between uh, program code and uh, blockchain structure that I have seen to date. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a tighter one, but I've never seen it. Yep. Um, and just to be clear, Rolang. And uh, the Rolang language was designed in 2005. I have changed, uh, so so uh, Satoshi hadn't even dreamed up the blockchain. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay, and there's lots and lots of, of good, um, solid evidence that Rolang was designed in 2005. Yeah, it totally uh, is. It's, yeah. Um, and if, it, <laughs> but if uh, no, no, I mean, you know, we're on video. It must be true, right? <laughs> it's That's right. No, but people can go look at, at yeah. the, uh, at the uh, uh, ETAPS papers. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah, it has been adapted, but the, um, but the core idea has, um, has, has been around. Actually, the core idea was around since 2002. Yeah, uh, that's when I that's when I came up with the idea, mm -hmm. um, and but I didn't write it up until uh, 2004, um, <clears throat> and uh, submitted it for publication in 2005, <laughs> and then I provided an implementation of that um, in the same year, um, and people can go and play with that implementation as well on GitHub. Yes. Uh, so anyway, so the uh, kind of the, the point I was making, and I got I got a little bit lost uh, because there's so much rich stuff to talk about is. Um, uh, that that the um, if these are streams, then notice that it, it could be that if you're wandering down into a stream of values, that somewhere down in there you hit a snag in the sense that yanking on the stream will cause things to blow up, like you hit a memory error or something, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. or you uh, you 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 there's some er erroneous aspect of the computation. So in that particular case. What you want to do is you want to interleave these streams in as fair a manner as possible uh, while you're exploring in deep into these streams uh, to, to pick out a tuple of values that matches the condition. Um, and that's where the Oleg Logic T uh, monad construction comes in. And again, that paper came out, I think it was in 2007, 2008, so, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, uh, and so, so, so all of that, all of those notions were um, provided um, uh, way back when, like over a decade ago. Um, and and yet, magically, all of these notions map onto the blockchain perfectly. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's that's really something to take a look at. Is like, wow. Right? When, you, when, you, when you just draw out the standard graphical representation of the blockchain, which is what's up top here, you can map it directly on to the program syntax. Yeah, and I think in, in the more um, we become familiar with the blockchain space, I think it becomes especially obvious the planning and the foresight that went into um, uh, the blockchain by Satoshi um, in that a lot, of the, a lot of the fundamental ideas say address Right, like if we if you think of an address, it's a place on the blockchain where people can send and receive things. But also, um, in terms of hardware, in terms of hardware, in terms of memory, um, a place where something's stored. You know what I mean? Um, so in the same way, I think um, that the lower down, the more fundamental, um, the more fundamental the idea is, the better it scales and the more applications it has. And I think that's the case uh, within the row calculus and when within Rolang is that. The foundation is is so solid that it does scale and has so many applications. Um, yeah. What I also wanted to, uh, what maybe would be a, a good thing to talk about, um, is that so this the four comprehension here, Scala program programmers will notice is the receiving end. This is input, um, which means that there's a dual output going on. That's um, correct. That's right. right. So how does um, input output relate to uh, transaction? No, thank you. That's a that's a really good question. And so if we go here, um, the standard um, rule or transition rule for the for the VM. So I'm just gonna in order in, in order to simplify our discussion just a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna reduce this down to just a single a single one with no condition and. We can we can we can build the more complex rule if we wish, but just just for the purposes of our discussion. So sure. if if we sit here, and then we send uh, some data on the channel, then um, this reduces. My fingers are not working. This reduces to um, p, in which everywhere we have a y. We replace it with the with um, the data. Now, in this particular case, the way I'm writing it, the data is some code, um, uh, and it happens to be the code of the contract queue. 
Um, and in this way, you get all kinds of interesting state mobility. So this is the this is sort of the most simple form of the um, the transition rule. And this is this is your transactional semantics right here. Mm -hmm. If you have a process or a thread that is sending some data on X, and it's running concurrently with a process that is listening for data on X, then they synchronize at X. The data goes over the channel that's created by the name x and um, is bound to y inside p's execution. So if x is an address, this is the value you're locating at the address. And this is a client of that address that's reading the data at the address and then running in an envir environment in which it knows that that's the data that was at that address. Okay, so that's that's the idea, and so this turns out to be the transaction, and this is the only transaction. So a transaction is the successful transmission of a message um, between a listening and a sending party. That's correct. That's exactly right. Now, in the general case, you'll have you'll have um, a a reader that's looking at several addresses, and only uh, will only go forward if they if the values there match a certain condition. In which case, um, if these are all independent addresses, you have potentially independent um, senders or writers to all those addresses, all running concurrently with this reader. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the that's the um, the variation of this rule that you can write down. Now, notice that this allows um, for two different kinds of race conditions. One is you have one um, one reader and two writers, and the other is that you have, um, there we go. And you have two readers and one writer. So these are the two different kinds of race conditions. And, and now, in order to have every um, node or every VM that is operating on the same namespace, i.e., the same set of X's, or even overlapping set of X's, here. Um, what you what you have to do is guarantee that they all agree on who wins these races. So now now you ask about storage versus consensus, right? So this is the consensus part of the puzzle, right? So they when when they're all working um, independently, they have to engage in some consensus algorithm um, that allows them to come to an agreement on um, wh which what are the winners of the race. And notice that if 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 there um, if there are no races and contracts are working on isolated names, right? So you could have you could have a, a situation like this one here. Okay, you can have a situation like this one where this is working on X one, Y one. This is x1, and over here, sorry about that. No. Stretch this out a little bit. And reduce the font. There we go. It's still readable, I hope. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's say that over here, this is x2, um, and this is um, x2. Sorry, I, I was overzealous in my cut and paste. Okay, so then, um, these two transactions can proceed entirely in parallel, right? Yeah, different um, channels. They don't touch each other, right? There's no contention at X2. Yeah. It's not even right? that they don't touch, it's that they are undefined for each other. They don't exist, right? I mean, they, they from the perspective of each channel, they're entirely unaware. <laughs> but yeah, um, let, me, let me make a, uh, one modification here. Mm -hmm. uh, oops. Mm -hmm. Come on, fingers. 
Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, we don't know what's inside P1 or, or uh, P2 or Q1 or Q2. So okay. maybe, maybe, they sure. talk to, yeah. maybe they talk to each other later, mm -hmm. but certainly there's no contention at X1 and X2. If, if we make the assumption that X1 and X2 are distinct. Yeah. All right. Un under that, then, then these two transactions, they can be ordered in any way we want. We don't care. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yep. and, and that's perfectly safe. And as long and everyone, every instance of the VM that's working on a namespace that includes X1 and X2 um, can happily uh, um, allow for any order of this particular transaction. Gotcha. Because it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and, go ahead. Uh, so, well, I was just going to say um, so that uh, to put it in perspective for consensus, the uh, Third from the bottom, uh, the X uh, sending Q1 or sending Q1 and Q2. Yep, two X. Uh, there are two race conditions for that. Uh, there are two, or there are two possible outcomes. One yes, where, possible outcomes, yes. yep, one where uh, the four comprehension receives Q1 and one where it receives Q2. That's right. Um, and That's under right. and un, and when either of those um, occurs, the other process is rendered inert. Um, as not other, necessarily because we don't know. So remember, we don't know what's happening inside P. Yeah. Well, right? well okay. Yeah, yeah. So he, all right. he might later continue interaction on X. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. And, and we know that X is in scope for P yeah. because it's in scope at, at the the out you know in the outer level. Yeah. So it could right. recurse. Cool. Okay. Exactly. Um, all right. Um, and then the the same for the bottom one where um, one where X or two options for two inputs to receive X and then, right. yep. So, uh -huh. and, and, and it's particularly because of the, the subsequent behavior that races can be dangerous, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, if it, if it were the case that, um, that, that, you know, X was a one-time use then there's a winner and a loser, yeah. but, um, but what those two represent is potentially multiple values add to give an address. Yeah. So we don't know whether the address is, you know, 10 or five, mm -hmm. right? And, and so if the address is, is, is an address in a ledger, right? And Q1 and Q2 are, are tokens, um, then that could be a problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially if inside P here, there's a subsequent read. Yeah. Right? It goes back to the X and says, tell me your value again, I forgot. Yeah. Right, and then it gets Q two, and it can be potentially confused. Yeah. Right. Um, so then, so then, in in the final implementation, just how you're uh, conceiving it now, will um, these transactions, or will a transaction need to be fully validated before the next occurs um, within a namespace within so over this channel? Um, so, so there will be a transaction schedule. But the schedule itself doesn't have to be um, a total order. It can be a partial order. So for example, um, this transaction here is not ordered with respect to this transaction here. Right. All right. So 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 in terms, so so let's go, let's go back. I've been I've been wanting to make this point for a while. Mm -hmm. And we have about one minute left. Yep. So 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 what's kind of cool is row lang contracts textually represent blockchains and blockchains are a good storage representation for uh, certain sub uh, segments of row lang contracts or a fragment of the row lang contracts that's what we get that's what we can see immediately from this diagram now what's what's what we're going to do that's really kind of cool is we're going to store the vm state in a blockchain. Mm -hmm. So what will be sitting at these addresses um, uh, in part will be VM state. So what will that correspond to? Well, that will correspond to a key value database in which keys um, uh, turn out to be, um, uh, uh, keys can be bound to values, they can be bound to continuations, mm -hmm. which is what we, were, what we were seeing here, these P's after four comprehensions are continuations. Mm -hmm. so if there's no data at a key, so what are the keys? The keys are these X's here. Mm -hmm. if there's no data at a key, 
then a program that comes in like this will store the p at the x mm -hmm. or, or, or 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 at tuples of x's so um under under that uh, uh, under under those um interpretations let me now go back to here um we'll we'll be storing values at keys continuations at keys um and we'll also be storing transaction schedules yeah that's and that's all we store mm -hmm. in the blockchain itself cool um, maybe uh, maybe next time we end up well we have one of these conversations we can discuss um, then in and from from a sense of uh, deployment um, where code is stored and how uh, codes will be loaded uh, and how state will be loaded um, to those codes right because I mean if we're only storing state on the blockchain which is all that's essential we have to have a, a way to synchronize those. Um, yeah, totally, totally. No, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about the deployment story. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate your time, Greg. Enjoy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for organizing these and for hounding me to, to make sure it gets done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's permissible harassment. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. All right. Okay, um, you, have a, you have a good evening. All right. You too. We'll see you later. Yeah, ciao.